All right, we we finished up Romans chapter three last time, and anybody that's ever done any evangelizing knows probably has at least verse twenty three memorized. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's that's part of the Romans road to to lead people to faith in Christ. And and chapter three, it's it's basically it's about uh, how everyone is under sin, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you have the law of Moses or you don't have the law of Moses. Every one of us is guilty before God, and, and Paul says that the law, it, it closes our mouth it, so that we have nothing to say. We, we can't justify ourselves. We, we have no excuses when it, when it comes time to, to be judged before the king, and, and so if we're living under the law, we're going to be in, in, in bad shape. So he's going to bring, bring us under conviction here, show us how we can be justified so we can stand in that day of judgment and talks about how our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God and and how we're, when we share this gospel of grace, how we're going to be slandered. People are going to say that when that we are, that we're telling people, let's go ahead and commit evil so that, uh, how does he put that? Go ahead and commit evil so that good may come out of it. And of course, Paul has to constantly, uh, counteract that 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 slander those false accusations and say no we're not telling people to go out and sin we're saying that god is righteous and our our unrighteousness demonstrates his righteousness but once we have come to faith in christ we're not going to want to live the way we did before we're going to have a new heart and a new new attitude so he talks about there's no one that's righteous not even one no one does good god is the only one who's good and he talks about, he says, now the, he said, the law is going to close our mouths. Everyone's going to be accountable. No one's going to be justified in his sight through the law. The law, all it does is gives us knowledge of sin, makes us see what sin is. Paul, in chapter 7, he's going to say that the law showed me, he said, I wouldn't even know what sin was if the law hadn't said, thou shalt not covet. So it showed me what sin was. And it says that the, uh says, now the, Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has has been manifested, or it's been revealed, or it's made known. It's always been there. He's going to tell us that in chapter four now that righteousness, apart from the law, has always existed, but now it's it's been revealed. It's manifested. It's he's God's making it clear now that it comes through Christ. Before the righteousness, it was somewhat veiled. Abraham believed God; it was credited to him as righteousness, but it wasn't really understood exactly how you know god was going to make a person righteous through the through the propitiation uh from christ so now it's been manifested and also something there it's i don't know if we kind of glossed over it but um it says in verse 25 it says where we talked about god publicly displayed jesus as a propitiation in his blood and that was to demonstrate his righteousness because it says because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Up, up until Christ, sins were not punished, not eternally anyway. There was you know, temporal, uh, you could say discipline or temporal punishment, but the eternal punishment was not, uh, was not made until the cross. So God, had, God demonstrated his righteousness through the cross, through the propitiation of Christ. Because otherwise, you could accuse God of being unjust for not punishing sin. But he he is just. He is righteous. So that demonstrated it because of Christ's propitiation. He took the penalty. He paid the price for all of our sins. And those who put their trust in him will not pay the eternal penalty. That eternal penalty will be paid at the, at the judgment when Christ returns. Those who reject this his propitiation reject his gift of righteousness will pay for their sins but anyway um so so christ on the cross demonstrated god's righteousness and let's see and he is just and the justifier of those who have faith in jesus so he's just because sin is punished and he also justifies those who have faith in jesus even though they apart from christ they would not be justified 
So and then he, again, he says that this justification by faith is for both Jews and Gentiles alike, the circumcised and the uncircumcised. He's going to talk about that, expand on that a little more in chapter four. And he says it's through, through faith, the, the God that justifies the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by faith is one. It's the same God. There's, there's not there's not two gods. There's not two methods of righteousness. It's one. It's by faith, whether you're Jew or Gentile. And then he again finishes that last verse. Again, he has to uh, defend this doctrine of grace. That those that are going to say, "Oh, do we nullify the law?" Then he says, "No, we don't nullify the law through faith. We we establish it. We uphold the law by faith. We now and we we uphold it. We or new creations if we trusted in Christ and we don't want to break the law, even though we don't, we, even though we're not." justified by the law. So that that's a summary of Romans chapter 3. So in chapter 4, picks right up, continues on, and he talk, starts talking about Abraham. Because Abraham, well, first of all, who, who's Abraham? Says Abraham is our forefather according to the flesh. So who would that be? Who would Abraham be the forefather of? Who, who claimed Abraham as their father? Go ahead, Rob. I didn't say anything. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. That, that would be the Jews, wouldn't it? They 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 claimed that Abraham was their father. Remember in, in John chapter eight, when Jesus talked to the Pharisees, they said, Our father is Abraham. And Jesus said, If if Abraham was your father, you would be doing the things that Abraham did. He said, But instead you're trying to kill me. He says, You're of your father, the devil. So the, the 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 forefather according to the flesh that that's Abraham for all the Jews they considered Abraham their forefather they 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 traced their lineage back to to Abraham every every good uh, devout devout Jew every Israelite would say Abraham is our father so Paul's appealing now to the Jews to the to the circumcised those that are, that are living under the law of Moses he says. So what what did Abraham say? This is our forefather. That's the one that you're calling your father. What did he find out about this? And so what did Abraham find out? Remember, Abraham was what was it, 460 years before the law? Yeah, he's Paul's talking to the Jews now. He's talking to the circumcised, those who are living under the law, trying to make themselves righteous through the law. He's saying, What did Abraham find? Because Abraham, their father, the one that they're they're uh, tracing their lineage through. What did he find 460 years before the law? If you're trying to be justified through the law, how did how did Abraham? How was Abraham justified before the law came? So here's what he said. What did Abraham find out? He says if Abraham was justified by works, he'd have something to boast about, but not before God. You know wh why would? Well, first of all, what does it mean to be justified by works? What or what does it mean to be justified? If he's to be justified by works is what? How would you define to be justified? Go ahead, Mark. Uh, found blameless. Yeah. Yeah. Without, without, blame. without blame. Yeah. In in a right standing with God. You're, yeah. And it says if, if Abraham, if he could be justified, if he could be found blameless, or if he could be declared righteous, if he'd be in a right relationship with God by his works, he'd have something to boast about, right? If, I mean, if I can make myself good enough, I can keep the commandments uh, well enough to be justified, I can, I'd can. i have something to boast about, but not before God, because God knows uh, even if outwardly we might we might uh, appear blameless to, to men, we might look good. God knows our heart, so we... We're not going to have anything to boast about before God, are we? So, yeah, so in order to be, if you want to try to be justified by works, you're going to have to be absolutely perfect, including all of your thoughts and all the intentions of your heart. And, of course, only Jesus could pull that one off. So we'd have to never once commit a sin, even in our thoughts. All right. So let's see. Yeah, so you'd have something to boast about. You'd, you'd have done something that only Jesus has done, wouldn't you? That that would be 
that would be uh, worth boasting about if you can pull pull that off. I I remember talking to somebody once. Well, you, I think you all know him. He he uh, well, he passed away uh, a couple of years ago. I think maybe two years ago. Um, I remember sharing the gospel with him once, and and he said uh, I asked him if he was a sinner, and he said, "No, I'm not a sinner." I said, you mean you've never sinned? He said, no, I've never sinned. And so I asked him if I could shake his hand. I said, because there's only ever been one person that ever accomplished that. I said, you've done something that only Jesus has, has done. So I don't know if he ever uh, that had any impact on him or not. But um, as far as I know, he didn't come to faith in Christ. But I don't know what might have happened on his, on his death. Yeah, I went to his uh, uh, funeral service and the sermon was right on the dot on the gospel that mm -hmm. you know and, and i remember what you say about them i i was you know yeah. wondering <laughs> yeah and, and, yeah and you know god was was gracious he gave him time to uh he, you know he didn't he didn't die instantly i mean he had he was on a you know we think all oh, that's terrible that someone has to suffer on their deathbed but but that's really god being merciful isn't it he's given someone a, a lost sinner time to to reflect and think about how futile it is to to think that you can make yourself righteous and so i don't know i wouldn't yeah. be wouldn't be surprised if we see him in heaven maybe on on his yeah. bed it, it was definitely a christian um you know like service the, the message was loud and clear well, that's great yeah yeah, yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we see him in heaven. All right. Um, all right. So Abraham was not justified by works. How, how was Abraham justified? According to verse three. That's it. That's a by faith. Yeah, by faith. Abraham believed God. It was reckoned to him as righteousness. He, he trusted God. Pa Paul quotes that. That's from uh, Genesis 15. Paul quotes that, I don't know how many times, it, I think a couple times in Romans, probably a couple times in Galatians, Abraham will leave God and it was reckoned to him or credited to him as righteousness. And that, if you recall, that was way back in Genesis 15. I think he was only, was he only 75 years old at that time? And the, the point being that it was, and he's going to make this point in Romans chapter 4, that it was be well before Abraham was circumcised because the, and you know, that was something that was so important to the Jews, their, their physical circumcision. They thought if a person wasn't circumcised, they couldn't be declared righteous. And it was in, yeah, it was in Genesis chapter 15. Excuse me. I think, I think Abraham's about 75 years old. It probably even says it in there somewhere. Um, this is where God makes his promise to Abraham. He says that, says the word word of the lord came to abraham in a vision saying do not fear abraham i am a shield to you i am your i am your very great reward that that's a i, I love that who, who is abraham's reward it's the lord and this and that the lord is our reward too isn't he what what better reward than to, to have the lord so i'm a shield to you and i'm your your very great reward exceeding the king james I am your exceedingly great reward. And Abraham said, Oh, Lord God, what are you going to give me? So I'm childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. He said, You haven't given me an offspring, one born in my own house as an heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body will shall be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look toward the heavens, count the stars, be able to count them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. It's, it's going to be as innumerable as the stars in the heaven. Then verse 6, then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And this was long before, before he was circumcised. I think it's in chapter 17 that he becomes circumcised, which is, yeah, he's 99 years old. It's going to be when Abraham is circumcised after Ishmael turned. And actually, I think, is it chapter 12? Let's see. No, it's not chapter 12. Okay. Well, anyway, 
point there, it was Abraham was declared righteous. He was justified by faith. And it was long before, long before he was circumcised. And I was trying to see if I can find an, an age there. I'm pretty sure it was like 75. So anyway, yeah, because this is 10 years later at age 85. Yeah, 10 years after the promise. So yeah, Genesis 12, 12, 5. Let's see. Yeah, Genesis 12, 4, Abraham was 75. So I'm not sure he's, how old he is in chapter 15. But anyway, it's long before long before he was circumcised. All right. So he was, he believed God. It was reckoned to him or credited to him. It was placed on his account, imputed. And then let's see. Then verse four the one who works, his wages is not reckoned as a favor, but is what is due. And you all can relate to that every time you get your paycheck. It's, it's not a gift. It's not because. CBC is so generous that they say, hey, I want to give you a paycheck you know, this week. It's because you earned it. You worked hard for two weeks or, or uh, however long it was. You earned that paycheck. So if, if we could be justified by our works, then we'd, we'd earn salvation. God would owe us. He, and God is not going to be indebted to anyone. He, God doesn't owe anyone anything other than the, the wages of sin, which is death. So nobody can say God is obligated to them that he owes me salvation. And, you know, it, it's, I don't know, it's sad when, when I hear, when someone goes through a tragedy and they get angry and bitter with God, you know, why, you know, why is God doing this to me? I don't, and, and the implication is, you know, I, I've been such a good person. I don't deserve for anything bad to happen to me is that, is that God somehow owes us a, trouble-free life and I don't know it's, it's always I think it's tragic when someone gets angry and bitter with God because of uh, um, because of difficulties in their life and and it's you know very well could be a tragedy you know losing a family member or you know heaven forbid you, you lose a child I can't imagine anything worse than that and but but that's you know but to get angry and bitter with God um, and I don't know. I guess if I ever lost a child, I maybe I could understand why they would get angry with God. But you know, I don't know. But no matter, you know, no matter how good a life we we think we've lived, God still doesn't owe us anything. And it's you know to blame God for our for our difficulties in life is is uh, I don't know. We're placing the the blame of the wrong place. Anyway, um, so wages, yeah, verse four, Romans four, verse four, one who works his wages is not reckoned, is not reckoned as a favor, but is what is due. So wages, you know, that's payment for, for what we've done. The wages of, I guess you could say the right wages of righteousness would be eternal life, but none, no one's righteous. The wages of sin is death. So that's that's what our wages are for every every single person. Um, let's see, verse five: the one who does not work but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Um, so so God justifies the the ungodly, that, and that goes against our pride, doesn't it? To, to, I mean that that. Who's the ungodly? That's every one of us before before Christ, isn't it? God justifies God justifies the ungodly. That that's offends our pride, doesn't it? As a lost person, if you told me I was ungodly, that I would have that would have been fighting words. Yeah, what do you mean I'm God I'm I'm ungodly? I go to church every Sunday, I was baptized as an infant, you know, I was an acolyte. How can you call me ungodly? Yet God justifies the ungodly. Isn't 
It's interesting. He says the one that does not work. You know, does that mean we don't do any any work? What, is, what do you think he means by that? One who does not work. One who doesn't share the gospel um, to um, others, like um, evangelizing. Well, in this case, I think what he's saying, the one who does not work, I think he's saying the one who's, who's not trying to do good works to make themselves righteous, I think is what it, I think is the context here. Um, okay. Because because he's talking about in verse four, he's talking about when a man works, his wages are not a gift, but they're an obligation. So in other words, if you're if you're working for your salvation, working for your righteousness, you're trying to make God obligated to you. Now he's saying if a person doesn't work, if a person's not trying to make God obligated, but they believe him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. So I think that I think that goes hand in hand with um this is Romans four. I think it goes hand in hand with uh Hebrews four. Hebrews four talks about resting from our works. Let, let me let me go there once. Hebrews four. Hebrews 4 talks about um, there's a promise remaining of entering into his rest. Uh, it says, we, had the, we who've had the good news, the gospel preached to us, just as it did to them, but the word they heard didn't benefit them. It didn't profit them because it was not united by faith. It says, we who have believed enter into that rest. And then if you jump down to verse 10, the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. So I think he's talking about resting from our own works of righteousness, trying to, to work to earn God's favor, trying to work to earn our salvation. I think that's what he's saying there. So we have to repent of those dead works. You know, Hebrews 5 and 6, chapter 6 talks about repentance from dead works. So the, the Hebrews, the Jews, they would be doing all kinds of uh, works to try to obligate God, to try to earn his favor. But so it's so in other words, like the one who does not work can be said like the one who doesn't strive, right? That Maybe that's a better way to put it. Yeah. The one who's not striving, thinking that they're obligating yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. Because God. Because we know we're going to do good works after we're saved. It's like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It, by, by grace, we're saved through faith, not of works. It's a gift of God so that no one may boast. But in verse 10, but we're God's workmanship created unto God for good works that we should walk in them. So, yeah, it's it's we do. We certainly do good works now. Sharing the gospel is one of them, as you said earlier. Um, but we're not saved by the works we're not doing those works to try to be saved we're not doing we're not striving to try to make ourselves perfect because only christ can make us perfect right so yep yeah thank you sandra all right so god justifies the ungodly the one who's not working for righteousness and uh in that that, that goes along with what Jesus said in the gospel. Remember, he said to the Pharisees, because the, the Pharisees were, they were criticizing Jesus for eating with sinners. And Jesus said, it's it's not the, the well, it's not those that are healthy that need a physician, it's the sick. He said, I did not come for the righteous, I came for sinners. And so he's saying to the, to the self-righteous, the, the scribes and Pharisees, the, those that are working, for their righteousness. He said, I didn't come for you. I didn't come for the I didn't come for you who think you're righteous, you who think you're godly. I came for the ungodly. I came for the unrighteous. I came for the sinners. I came for those who were not working for their righteousness, who who have reached the, the point where they realize they they can't make themselves righteous. And that's what the law is supposed to do. It's supposed to show us that we can't make ourselves righteous. It, to bring us to the point of of hopelessness and despair where i where paul says in chapter seven who's gonna 
save me from wretched man that I am. Who's going to save me from this body of death? I'm trying hard to keep this long and I can't do it. I'm finding out I'm a sinner. Who's going to save me? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It laws our tutor, our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. So anyway. All right. So his faith, his faith is credited as righteousness. And Second Corinthians 5.21 talks about that as well, that, that our sin is credited to Christ and his righteousness is credited to us. And that's that's that righteousness that's manifested in Romans 3 that Paul talks about. It's now it's been manifested that it's from Christ as a free gift. And so our faith has to be credited as righteousness and it's and it's Christ's perfect righteousness that's credited to us because remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 20, says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. So we have to have even better righteousness than the scribes and Pharisees. And remember Paul in Philippians 3, he said that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee. He said, as to righteousness that comes from the law, he was blameless. He says, but he counts all that as rubbish because he wants to be found in Christ, not having his own righteousness that comes through the law, but the righteousness that comes by faith, the righteousness of comes by faith in Christ. That's Philippians 3. So that, that's the only righteousness that's going to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. And it's a free gift credited to our account, like the taking your college entrance exam, having somebody take it for you and get a perfect score and you get credit for it. Go ahead, Sam. So Tim, um, like, you know, these in the denominational churches, they have the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. And yeah. um, I mean, I was also part of one such church before I got saved, but um, we would like, you know, stand up and read that or sing it and, you know, things like that. But I know it was just head knowledge and I can only speak for myself, like based on what my story is, you know, but um, I was just talking to someone about that, thinking, saying that uh, it's just head knowledge and it was never heart um, relationship with Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Um but, um, you know, they were saying, like, but what if they are speaking those words from the book mm -hmm. and they believe it? Mm -hmm. They do believe that Jesus is um, the son of God and everything that's in the creed. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to that church. Isn't that all that qualifies them for salvation? Yeah. But yeah, I don't know if that they would really they aren't born again, you know. Right. Yeah, right. If right. If they're not born again, then they're not saved, obviously. But on, on the, by the same token, though, there I I do know some. There are some in those denominational churches that that recite that creed that that are that have truly been born again. It's it's a very small minority. Um, so I wouldn't say you know everybody that stands and reads that creed creed is not saved. But but yeah, you, I mean, you make a good point. Just having the head knowledge. I mean, I was one of them. I was in one of those churches for uh, most of my life. And yeah, it was just head knowledge. I, I I had it all memorized. I could tell you, you know, reading all those, you know, the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, had all that memorized forward and backward. But yeah, it, it was just head knowledge. It, I was not born again. But, but, but I also know some in those denominations that a very small minority that that are truly born again yeah. yes maybe like like the writers of hymns and things like they were they were born again people right like but then somehow things got diluted and mm -hmm. and the denominational churches um have become dry now right most of them at least like yeah. you said there may be a few in there that um God can use to bring revival there as well. Yeah, 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 and you know, it, it's it's kind of amazing that I mean, I guess it's just you know God's amazing grace that 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 that, that there are some people that get saved in the, even in those denominational churches that aren't really tr tr uh, proclaiming the true gospel, and yet there's still some that get saved. There's I guess there's enough truth there. That a few here and there get saved. Yeah. 
So, but you would you would think I don't know you you would, you, you would think most people if they did get saved in that that they would they would leave that, that you know the Holy Spirit would give them discernment that hey there's there you know there's not you know what they're teaching here isn't really true but but again maybe maybe the Holy Spirit is is telling them hey stay here you can make a difference maybe you know maybe you can help to lead others out of you know out of the domain of darkness so I don't know. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, like, it's not like that they taught things that were bad. Like, they just didn't, um, I think, teach the whole gospel. Right. I would put it that way. Like, you know, they just kind of talked about a subset of it, not so much in a practical way, how we live a transformed life, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's the part I think that might have been missing. Um, yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, I was just processing and thinking like, I think what makes us truly born again is like um, our life, right? Like should show it like when we um, think something that's not okay or watch something that's not okay. Like you feel that conviction, like which was never there before, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think once you get born, you're born again, like the Holy Spirit's in you and you, um you're, you're sensitive now yeah. um Amen. to god and um and then you want to you know repent right away and come back to him you want to get closer to him and then a lot, the desire for those things dies completely too over time you know so and that's the kind of change i think that um is the evidence of someone being born again yeah yeah that's, that's um part of the yeah 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 good point yeah if there's not any fruit you know like Jesus said in John 15, you know, you'll bear much fruit and prove that you're my disciple. So yeah, there's gotta, gonna be some evidence. And when, you know, I'm, I'm thinking more as you're, as you're sharing that, that, you know, that, yeah, in a lot of those cases, there's, there's really probably nothing that's really maybe heretical that's being proclaimed, but it's just not the full, the full counsel of God. And it, you know, they're just sharing maybe a subset of the gospel, not sharing the full gospel. So that's a good point too. And, and, you know, even, even a good evangelical church where the gospel is being proclaimed, the full counsel of God is being proclaimed, you're still going to have people in there that they hear the gospel every week and are not born again. They, they they become immune to it for some reason. They can hear it over and over again and still not respond in repentance and faith. So I don't know. I'm not, <laughs> I don't know what you do about that when um, right yeah it's like that you know saying goes that if you sit in a garage you don't become a car you can yeah, sit there 20 years and <laughs> it yeah. not have any effect um yeah. yeah yeah ultimately i think it's the holy spirit you know that Amen. draws us and of course we need to do our part in not rejecting him but Amen. reciprocating to his invitation every time and that's how we get closer to yeah. him Amen. Yeah. Like, like in, in Acts 7, uh, Stephen says, you know, you're always resisting, you stiff neck people, you're always resisting the Holy Spirit. So yeah, don't resist the Holy Spirit when he's bringing conviction. And, and, uh, and, you know, I think sometimes maybe, you know, it seems like, you know, God, God will use, and I talked about tragedies earlier. A lot of times God will use a tragedy to bring someone to faith. You know, maybe someone's heard the gospel over and over again, but until as long as things are going well, they they don't see any any need to entrust their life to Christ. But when a you know tragedy strikes, sometimes that's what God uses to as the final I don't know the final uh, straw or whatever you want to put it that the Holy Spirit brings conviction. And they finally surrender and say, "Okay, I give up. I'm I'm tired of fighting you, Lord. I'm I'm going to entrust myself to you. I'm going to receive this this eternal life. I'm going to." want you to make me a new creation in christ so right and and the thing is those the creeds are not bad those are good you know because yeah the truth of it is good like i mean i feel like you know now when i read that same creed it it's in a whole different light like mm -hmm. i never saw it before you know Amen. i just don't know how to explain it and but yeah. it's like it means so much to me you know than it did before i would just like read it like you know and that's it yeah. Um, 
but now it means it's meaningful to me you know so mm -hmm. i think that's the the difference there Amen. I I can totally relate to that. Even even hymns, some of these hymns that have these this deep theological message. I I had, you know, I could sing, I could memorize, had me numerous hymns memorized, but they didn't mean anything to me. But once I was born again, once I received the Spirit of God, I'm starting to read these hymns or sing these hymns. I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, this is so amazing that you know this. this Yeah, it's, it's almost like reading it for the first time, Yeah. you know, or singing it for the first time, like you, you're seeing something you never saw before. And I think that's the Holy Spirit, because he brings life, you know, um, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Amen. Yeah. And, and the same thing with the scriptures. I, I used to read my Bible when I was lost and it didn't mean a thing to me. I, I wore out a Bible. I had it taped together and I had no idea what I was reading. It was just a bunch of fairy tales. And then once you know, you're know you born again, once you receive the spirit of God and he starts leading you into truth, it's like, oh my goodness, where, you know, where has this been? I'm, you know, it's like, I'm reading this For the first time, I've read this all my life, and all of a sudden, you know, this is God speaking to me. He's, he's his love letter that he's he's speaking to me. So yeah, it's I don't know, it's just so so fantastic the the love our God has for us. All right, so let's see. Oh, the yeah, that uh, verse five about the. He credits faith as righteousness. Um, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, 520, you know, we said about how Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And then in verse 48, he says, you must be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. So it's it's got to be his perfect righteousness. And then in Hebrews 10, 10 and 10, 14, it says that he has made perfect forever. Uh, those that are sanctified. 1010, he says, he has sanctified us once and for, by his offering of his body once and for all. And then in verse 14, he has perfected. And it's our it's our spirit that's perfected. Hebrews 12, 23, it says it's the spirits of the righteous that are made perfect. So he, he makes, the, the moment we're born again, our spirit becomes perfect. Our, our body won't become perfect until Christ returns and there's in the resurrection. That's in Philippians 3. Paul says, I haven't yet obtained perfection. He says it's going to happen at the resurrection. When when Christ comes, he says he's going to transform these lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. And then Matthew 13 says, Then the righteous will shine forth like the sun. And remember Daniel 12, 3 says, We'll shine, says, We'll shine like the stars of heaven forever and ever. And that's going to be at the resurrection when when our bodies are transformed to be like Jesus. So our spirit is perfect now. The moment we were born again in our body, even our body is going to be made perfect at the resurrection. So that, that's exciting. That's the that's the the hope of righteousness that we wait for by faith in Galatians five five. We're wait, waiting for that hope of righteousness when even our our bodies are going to be and our behavior will be perfect. Our, right now, our in you know, our spirit, we're perfect. Our we have that perfect righteousness credited to us, and then even our actions will be perfectly righteous at, when after the resurrection. All right, Colossians two ten. We are complete in Christ now. Let's see, yeah, Romans three twenty and Galatians two. No one will be declared righteous through the works of the law because you can't keep it perfectly. All right, so now down verse 6. Now he's going to, Romans 4, verse 6, he's going to talk about David now. And remember, now he's, he's speaking to the to the circumcised. He's speaking to the Jews. They would know about Father Abraham. They'd also know about David. David is their, their king. He's their hero. Abraham's their hero. David's their hero. Moses is their hero. So he found out what Abraham found out. Abraham found out righteousness by faith. Now he's going to talk about David. David is going to say, now David wasn't, even David wasn't declared righteous by works. He's going to say that David speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons or credits righteousness apart from works. And he's going to quote 
It looks like one of the Psalms, Psalm 32, I believe it is. It says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. That's David in, in Psalm 32. So he's appealing to these, to these Jews through their father Abraham and through their king David, saying Abraham wasn't righteous by the works of the law. David wasn't righteous by the works of the law. So then he's going to go back to circumcision again. And the, he says, is this blessing then upon the circumcised or the uncircumcised? That would be a, a reasonable question. He's, again, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles alike. He says, Let's see. It's a blessing. It's on both the circumcised and the un uncircumcised. That blessing is for all, all of those, uh, every person, just like all are under sin in chapter three, all can receive this blessing, Jews and Gentiles alike. And of course, the circumcised, that would be the Jews. The uncircumcised would be the Gentiles. Circumcised would be those with the law written on stone, the Gentiles would be those without the law or those that have the law written on their conscience. If you remember that from Romans chapter 2, we all have the, the law written on our conscience that we we have this conscience that God has given us that we know when we're doing something wrong. Uh, as a lost person, we tend to sear that conscience or ignore it at times and go ahead and do the things even though we know they're wrong. We just try to cover them up. That's why we do them in the dark. We, we like to keep our deeds hidden. That's why we don't come into the light. We know what we're doing is wrong, but we don't want it to be exposed. That's why there's so much activity at, at night for the lost. You know, the lost, when, when the lights go out, there's that's when all the activity happens, all that sinful activity, whether it's in the bars or the you know Las Vegas. They're very active at night. In the daytime, nobody wants to come out in the light and have their, their deeds exposed. So, anyway, um, so yeah, he's going to talk about Jews and Gentiles alike. From Well, actually, from verse 9 through 17, about half the chapter there, he's going to say it's the blessing. It's, and again, he's going to quote that uh, Genesis 15, faith was reckoned reckon to Abraham as righteousness. And then he's going to make the point here, starting in verse 10, that that faith was reckoned to Abraham before he was circumcised. Because that's the that's going to be the natural question for, for a Jew. Well, well, was he reckoned righteous before or after he was circumcised? Because the, the Jews would have thought that it was after he was circumcised, that that circumcision was part of his righteousness. But Paul's going to make it very clear here that no, the circumcision was a sign of the righteousness that comes by faith. That's what's so ironic about circumcision. They, it was a sign of the righteousness that comes by faith, a sign of the righteousness that comes apart from the works of the flesh. And they were making it a work of the flesh to, to make themselves righteous. It was complete opposite of what God intended for it. Go ahead, Sandra. It's, I think it's equivalent to today's, uh, like, first we believe, then we get baptized exactly it's not, you know the other way around that you be baptized and that's going to give you the salvation yeah great point it, yeah it's, it's exactly the same isn't it and 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 we do the same thing today with baptism there's many people that think their baptism is what saves them it's what makes them righteous there's some that teach that baptism is when they're born again and you can if you stretch john three enough you, you know if you torture it enough you can make it say you can almost make it say that because it talks about being born of the water and born of the spirit. And there are some that will say, oh, see, that means when you had water sprinkled on your head when you were an infant. But that's not what what Jesus is saying there. Yeah, the baptism, like you said, Sandra, the baptism happens after the, the, the water baptism happens after we believe, after we're born again. Um I mean, you can be baptized. I was baptized as an infant, but that didn't save me. All that did was make me wet. The, yeah, the it's a picture. the The water baptism is a picture of the the baptism that the Holy Spirit does when we believe. We're baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. 
So it's a picture that we've become identified with with Christ. And and Paul's going to expand on that in in chapter six about baptism. We're we're buried with Christ. We're we're identified with Him in His death, burial, and resurrection. So when we're baptized with water, when we're going under the water, it's a picture that we've been identified with Jesus in His death. When we come back up out of the water, it's a picture that we've been identified with Jesus in his resurrection, that we've now been, we're walking in newness of life, that we've been born again. So in that regard, that yeah, you could say that baptism and being born again are connected, but it's a, the water baptism is a picture that we have been born again. The water baptism is not what causes us to be born again. But anyway, all that to say what you summed up in one sentence, Sandra. So... <laughs> Anyway, all right. So, yeah, we'll get down to verse, let's see, um, down to verse 10 then. It's going to say, how then was it reconciled or reckoned to Abraham? How was righteousness reckoned to Abraham? It says, while he was uncirc while he was circumcised or while he was uncircumcised? It says, no, it says, it was not while he was circumcised, but while he was uncircumcised. And we saw that back in Genesis 15. That was that quote. And he wasn't circumcised until Genesis 17, probably 10 years later. So it was credited while he was uncircumcised. And then here, verse 11. Verse 11 makes it pretty clear what that circum, what the purpose of the circumcision was. In verse 11, it says it was the sign of circumcision, just like baptism, you could say, is a sign um, he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be reckoned to them. So it was a sign of righteousness that comes by faith, not by the works of the flesh. And they, they turned around and made it a work of the flesh, just like we do with baptism, like you said, Sandra. All right. And he's also the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. So he's Paul's trying to make it clear here that that Abraham is still the father of those who are uncircumcised or if it's circumcised if they receive the righteousness that comes by faith. And he'll in Galatians and Corinthians, he'll say a couple of times it's neither circumcision or uncircumcision means anything. It, it so what matters is the new creation. There's he says it. I think he says three three different times. Once he says, um, well, once he says it, what matters is is a new creation. I forget what he says the other two times, but uh, anyway, so. Paul's not ruling out that a circumcised person can be can be justified by faith. He's saying, yes, whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, you receive righteousness the same way by faith in Christ, same way Abraham did. All right. Um, yeah, so Abraham was declared righteous before Ishmael was born. And then he wasn't circumcised until age 99. That happened when Ishmael was 13. That's in uh, Genesis 17. So he was circumcised, or I mean, he was declared righteous in Genesis 15, somewhere between age 75 and 86. Because in Genesis 12, he's 75. In Genesis 17, let's see, I'm sorry, not 17, in Genesis, let's see, 16, he's 86 when, when Ishmael is born. So then in Genesis 17, when he's 99 years old, this is when Ishmael is 13, Genesis 17, Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him said, I am Lord Almighty, walk before me, be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you. I will multiply you exceedingly. Abraham fell on his face. God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be the father of a multitude of nations. He's repeating this same promise. No longer will you be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. 
I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. I'll make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you. Kings shall come forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. God said further to Abraham, now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. Now, verse 10, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. So it's a sign of the covenant in the flesh of your foreskin. Philippians 3, 3, Paul talks about that again. He talks about having no confidence in the flesh. He talks about being the true circumcision. He says, we're the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God, glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. So that's the true, true circumcision is putting no confidence in the flesh. The false circumcision does put their confidence in the flesh. The true circumcision boasts only in Christ, not in their own flesh. So that's what the circumcision was about. It was about a sign of the righteousness that comes by faith, faith in the promised seed, promised Messiah. So that's probably a good place to stop. So, so what's, what's our takeaway for today? We covered about the first 10 or 12 verses in Romans 4. Basically, it's about Abraham finding righteousness by faith and David the same thing so any anybody have any takeaways they want to share mark go ahead um just uh you know the example of abraham uh i think that's a you know a a, a figure in the bible that we we can um look to uh you know and um uh you know how how he had to he had nothing to go on you know it was just god's word mm. um so that's a tremendous uh tremendous leap of faith on his part yes. and, uh, to believe god to that he would fulfill the you know, that he would be the father of nations uh, mm. it's just it, 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 tremendous uh faith i'll say yeah good point i, I mean as you're saying that i, I can think of three Three profound examples where where uh, Abraham had to exercise faith. One, he had to leave this country and go where I'm telling you to go. Okay. Just just trust me. And then another one that I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Well, how's that going to happen? I'm I'm old. My wife is barren. How in the world is that going to happen? You had to trust him there. And then the next one, when he had to, when God had him sac. He told him to sacrifice yeah. Isaac. <laughs> Man, yeah. great point, Mark. Yeah, what tremendous example. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And he didn't have a Bible. The Bible wasn't written then. <laughs> We've got old New Testament and, and we still <laughs> struggle to trust God. Yeah. Yeah, great right. point, Mark. And then and then of course the you know, if you're if you're still striving to work your way to heaven, stop. Yeah. Amen. Stop doing that. Yeah. Yep. Trust God. Trust Christ. Trust Christ. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Mark. All right. Sandra, you had something you wanted to share? Yes. Uh, piggybacking on what Mark said, like, I mean, we have, um, you know, the story of the cross to look back to, mm. but um, all those that had an intimate relationship with God already in the Old Testament, like David and Moses and Elijah and Abraham, they didn't they didn't have that. So they, but they were looking forward to it and we, we look behind, but they look forward that this is to come and therefore we believe it by faith. Amen. Amen. Thank, thank you, Sandra. Dean, did you have anything to add? No, just uh, all work or dirty work, right? It's not measure up to anything. And we, um, we are so blessed to live in like, you know, doing this, um, we have something to look back to. Amen. Uh, 
And so God make it easy for us. And yet sometimes we fall short. <laughs> well, all the time, not sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure thankful for God's grace. Yeah. But, yeah. Thank thank you, Heen. Rob, what what are your thoughts? Well, this was for me, this was just another reminder of how blessed, um, how blessed and how close I was to not really even having a clue that I wasn't saved. Mm. I grew up of a certain faith. I was of a certain faith for 40 years and never, ever read the Bible, but thought because I was baptized that I had it, you know, mm -hmm. despite the lifestyle I was living. Mm. And I don't know why God finally made it, revealed himself to me, but, you know, man, it's just another reminder of how close I was to damnation, mm. <laughs> but Amen. for the grace, but for his grace put Amen. me on the right path. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Wow. So you were even older than I was when God finally showed you the light. Yeah. Yeah. I was about 35. You were 40, huh? Wow. All right. Somebody, I'm, I'm just, I don't know, as you're sharing it, I'm just overwhelmed with God's love and grace. Yeah. Somebody like to pray for us? Sure, I will. Thanks, Andrew. Father God, we thank you for your uh, love and thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for numerous second chances you've given us, and um, we thank you for um, your mercy, your grace upon us. We can never thank you enough. We can't even wrap our mind around or comprehend um, the extent of your goodness upon us when we we don't deserve it at all. Um, we thank you um, for uh, what you did for us on the cross and um, giving us new life and um, each of us at different stages at different points in our life were saved at whatever age but um, we know father god we often tell you that um, make it up for the lost time lord and uh, you are a redeemer of time and um, so father we ask you that um, in in the days ahead that you will um, make it up for us that we will, um, we will dive deeper into our relationship with you. We will draw closer in our friendship with you and, um, help us Lord to experience you and, um, in ways that we've never experienced you before and, um, show us things. Father, you say, um, when we seek you diligently, you will, um, show us things that we have not even seen or heard of, and you will reward those who seek you diligently. So help us, Lord, um, to do that. And um, we want to all the fullness of the life that you have. You came, you died, you rose again to give us. And we thank you so much for saving some of our loved ones around us. We ask you uh, for open doors for those that are not saved, that you will um, give us um opportunities lord and uh, help us not to hesitate but help us to be bold and courageous and um, grab those moments to be able to um, bring more into your kingdom we ask all these things in the precious name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen amen, amen. thank you Sarah. all right well you all have a, a blessed rest of the week i'm i'm just still marveling at, at god's grace uh, all, right. all right. Well, see you yeah. next Tuesday, Lord willing. Thank you, Sam. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye, bye.